we go to the right now. So hello again. Um, I believe Eleonora is, has introduced me. I am Michael Price, an artist uh, here in New York, and I will be presenting um, some interesting points for the materials class, the art materials class. And this will concentrate mainly on natural pigments, natural minerals and pigments, including natural dyes. And also in the following class, I will take a look at the substrates, the canvas panels and um, binding mediums and how to actually paint with these colors. Now, um, some of you have probably heard of natural mineral pigments, things like lapis lazuli, azurite, cinnabar. Some of you may not have, but I think all of you will know your um, tube of oil paint or acrylic paint that you buy from the art shop. This is now the most common thing that everyone is used to. And I will be talking about how you turn pieces of rock like this into, into paint, in what looks like regular paint. Now, um, let me just put up now on the screen, the first slide that I want to show. So, just wait for that. Okay, now, as I just, just said, I'm going to be presenting this difference. Um, why also I think it's important um, and we will take a look at quite a bit of art history at the same time. Now, here on the left, you see uh, an image of a range of the natural pigments, minerals, from the azurite, uh, lapis lazuli, malachite, cinnabar. In this image, you see orpiment, this yellow at the front, front middle, down to quite ordinary yellow ochres, um, which now, unfortunately, are also most often synthetic in your tube of paint. So um, I will be going into some detail in the, with the difference between these two. Now, let me move on to the second image. Now, we, we have uh, basic questions. Why use natural mineral pigments? when the paint industry supplies over 300 different hues and tones um, of, of colors. Uh, um, and the, one of the first questions is then, are there any advantages to using color prepared from rocks and crystals or natural dyes? And also what can we learn from the historical pigments. And, um, and also the question, of course, when, when did modern color in, in tubes, let me try and get this to show a bit better, in tubes become available. Now, um, just a bit of background. I started working with these pigments um, at the end of 1989. And I was not very happy with cobalt blue, and cadmium red, um, and all the other um, synthetic pigments in tubes of oil. I worked mainly with tubes of oil, not with, with acrylic. Um, at first, I had basically no idea uh, of what I was getting into when I first started um, trying out some of the natural colors. 
at the at first i bought them already prepared by kramer pigments from his shop in in munich just opposite the the uh, museum and uh, i encountered many many problems and some of those problems i will deal with as i go through and also how i solve the problems and uh, eventually um, I then started to publish papers on what I had found, and this led to a publication of my two volume book, uh, Renaissance Mysteries, which was published in 2017. Now, let me go on to the next slide. So again, here you see um, a selection of uh, quite quite a, a wide selection of the minerals and uh, here also you see some of my equipment for preparing uh, and crushing up the the initial pieces of rock in my uh, pestle and mortar the large uh, thing on the on the right there a smaller pestle and mortar which I, I picked up in Chinatown in, in New York. Um, it's based, this is basically used for, for preparing food, of course, and, uh, but was very good for the softer rocks like cinnabar. And uh, a part of the equipment you need for grinding down your pigments and also mulling the pigments in a resin or oil to to make your paint so um, there you see a short list on the right of the different pigments the blues mainly lapis lazuli um, the lapis lazuli uh, i can just show you here hopefully uh, this will show up it's not showing very well on my screen but it's this is the blue rock uh, from Afghanistan. Um, it was mined in Afghanistan even from e ancient Egyptian times. Uh, there are huge, huge deposits of this blue. Um, also found uh, in Iran, uh, formerly in Siberia, but it seems that those sources have now been depleted. And there's also lower grade of uh, lapis lazuli rock in Chile, in South America. Um, you can get a decent blue out of it, but it's, it's um, a lot of work. The other main blue is azurite, as I uh, showed you um, here, there. Okay, there we are. This comes from deep blue, pale blues, all sorts. Then there's the main greens. The main green, of course, is, is malachite. Um, and uh, this, is, this is a green mineral. Okay, I hope this is showing reasonably well on the, on the screen. Okay. And uh, also, thing you, you have, have green jasper. This is, um, but also indispensable on the natural palette uh, of colors. Then various other colors, and I will go into detail a bit more uh, later with, with fuchsite, green earths, turquoise, which, which is a, a, a beautiful sort of bluish green. Then you have the main reds, cinnabar, red jasper, red earths, red earth pigments that you can find in many, many places. Um, also the yellows. Now there are not as many natural yellows. There's basically orpiment and uh, various yellow ochres. Um, I'll talk about uh, one of the oldest uh, manufactured yellows at the end of the talk, that's a, a lead tin yellow. Then you have orange. Again, it's very restricted to Rialgar, but 
Rialgar is much more beautiful than any any orange that you'll get in your tube paint. Um, it's it's quite unbelievable, and it's one of the reasons why I can never go back to tube paint. Then you have browns, hematite, brown earths, and then metallic greys to blacks. You've probably never heard of stibnite or galena. Um, I have a little bit here. Uh, this is, if this shows up, hopefully quite well. This will give you a silver gray to a almost black and um, has been found in Renaissance paintings, especially for armor. So the metallic quality of armor in the warrior saints um, and quite an amazing color. Um, also, uh, Galena, okay, yeah, and uh, Galena, I don't, uh, yeah, I don't have any with me here offhand. Uh, and then uh, the blacks, pyrolusite and tourmaline. Uh, this is a, a tourmaline, gives you an incredible black. Uh, this particular piece is from Maine in, in, the, in the US. Very, very hard rock to crush, but a beautiful black pigment. And then um, whites are also limited to sericite and calcite. But there is no comparison with your modern lead white, titanium white, um, which I, I will talk a little bit more about that in when I come to whites. So now, here I now want to start discussing some of the differences with, with the natural blue pigments, those three on the left of azurite, which is from the same rock, but with different particle sizes. So you have a pale blue and a medium dark blue and a very dark blue. Now, I am able to get about 16 different grades of, of blue from the rock, according to the quality of the rock. And uh, if I move a little bit, I think I'm blocking. Then there's cobalt blue, which is, I think you all know, um, a modern synthetic pigment. It was invented in, I think it was 1806 by a French chemist. And it became one of the most common blues used. Um, and you find it, of course, first of all, in impressionist paintings and so on. Um, and, uh, it, it, it is possible to change this color chemically um, by uh, the manufacturers will, will uh, make variations of, of uh, the cobalt blue. Now, let me move on now. I want to just here, uh, I think you might find interesting. Um, the painting on the left was from round about 1982, 1983, when I was living in Germany, in Munich. And uh, this was one, a part of an exhibition, that uh, a one person exhibition at the time. And here you see um, cobalt blue mixed with titanium uh, white and some lead white. In those days, it was still possible to buy lead white before uh, the European Union and the US banned it from, from use in regular paint because of its toxicity. Um, however, I, I think the people who smoke cigarettes are probably doing more damage to themselves than working with these pigments. But the important point here is that you see that this the, the blue, when white is added to it, becomes somewhat gray. And this always disturbed me and I could never really find a solution, but I found the solution with azurite. Now the painting on the left, which I exhibited, uh, I think in tw yeah, 2016 
uh, in Chelsea here in New York. And um, this blue has no white added to it. This is the pale blue azurite, different particle sizes, as you can see, to give the, the, the this sort of waviness. So I was using the brush, just using wavy brush strokes. And, um, and really the, the blue was controlled just with the pigment particle size. And uh, down at the, the bottom, you'll see some larger waves um, where the particle size is bigger. The other colors, the orange is, is uh, an orpiment, which I think even on this screen, uh, you will agree is, is quite spectacular. And that's set against a natural indigo, that very dark, dark blue. So uh, that just gives you uh, an indication, of course, uh, I was painting quite differently in 1982 to, uh, I can't, can't even remember now how many years ago that is. So I'll move on now to the, the next slide. Now, this is a little bit more technical, but it's important to understand um, the main points here. Now, um, this, the scale um, you'll see with the azurite is 40 microns. Now, one micron is a thousandth of a millimeter. Okay, that's incredibly tiny. And the cobalt blue as a pigment, one pigment, and you can basically not really separate one pigment out in cobalt blue, but it's on average one micron in size. Now, the difference is, of course, the light indicated with these arrows shows you um, the, the light hitting the, the pigment particles and um, being reflected. Now, those little bits of yellow, uh, green and red that you see with the azurite, these are called inclusions. Now, these will be perhaps molecules or small amounts of other um, uh, rocks or, or even molecules that give you this different color. Now, when we, let me move on now to this next one. So you can see what's happening with the particle of azurite. Now, um, you may not have heard the term refractive index. Now, it basically means that here you have the incoming light hitting the particle and the particle goes, the light goes through the particle and the light is bent as it goes from air through a material. And that light, the bending of the light is called refraction, the refracted light. Now, the less the light is bent, the lower the refractive index. The more the light is bent, the higher the refractive index, and of course, the more opaque the pigment becomes. And so there now you see there's reflected light and there's also transmitted light, the light that has actually gone through the pigment. Now this, this is really important when we come to the colors. Now this, I hope it doesn't look as dark on your screen as it does on mine, but this is um, a painting with very, very large uh, pigment particles of azurite. And the blue below is very, very fine particles of azurite with just one layer for the pale blue. And the deep blue of the sky is uh, probably, if I remember correctly, about six, seven or eight layers of, of azurite. So uh, uh, in daylight, it's quite spectacular because it, it, it kind of buzzes a little bit. It vibrates visually and, and you, you experience this quite literally. Um, this, this, this painting was uh, 
from drawings I made on the southern coast of South Korea uh, when I was there um, a few years ago, and uh, a spectacular coastline. And in, in this painting, then in the, in the sky, uh, the white that you see, these sort of very free white brush strokes, that's just calcite. Now, the calcite is what is left over from, from the, um, it, it's, it's the marble, the white marble that's left over from lapis lazuli. And so nothing gets thrown away when I prepare my lapis lazuli, but it produces very, very interesting effects on top of the deep blue azurite. And the, uh, the green in the sky area, that's a Brazilian fuchsite. Uh, that is a, a beautiful sort of pale green. And the, the gray in the landscape, that's a, a large particle stip night. So just to give you an idea of some of the things you can do. Now, again, back to the sort of more scientific level there. Now the scale in both of these two images between azurite and cobalt blue, the scale is 50 microns. And the left, you can see a couple of particles of azurite. Now, um, you could feel, you would feel that particle between your fingertips with no problem. Uh, if you got it in your eye, it would really hurt. Now, the cobalt blue, you can't, you can hardly see any of the individual particles because they all appear as agglomerates of pigment. And this really shows you how incredibly fine the cobalt blue is and very opaque. And so when you paint a, a brush stroke of cobalt blue, there's really no point of painting another layer on top of it. You won't really change the color. So th this is completely different painting process using your modern tube colors, whether it's oil or acrylic, the pigments are basically the same, are the same, compared to natural pigments and minerals. Okay, let me move on now to the next slide. Now, again, just to reiterate the, the difference of the types of painting we are dealing with, you have uh, on the top, there some layers of azurite. There would there would be many more layers. Um, this this is just a simple diagram to show you that the under layer or the first layer would be a smaller particle, and as you build up the layers, you increase the size of your pigment particles. So you'll go from small to medium, medium, large, according to the blue you would like to end up with. So you need to have a little bit of an idea of the color you would like. Now below, there's a, a typical cross section of what cobalt blue would look like under the microscope. Below you've got your substrate canvas or panel and, and then um, a brush stroke of, of cobalt blue would, would give you something like that. Now the light is just being reflected from the surface. The light will not penetrate really to the ground, to the white ground of your canvas or your panel compared with the azurite at the top where you see the light being refracted through the pigment, hitting the white ground, and then being reflected and refracted through the pigment layer, and, and then going picked up by your eye. So it's quite a um, fascinating difference. And you can see this with a, a paint layer cross section under the microscope, anyone who has ever had um, any introduction into painting conservation um, may well get the opportunity to, to actually observe paint layers like this. And, and with a bit of luck, uh, you will see exactly 
something like this. Now, next, there you see me uh, a few years ago in my previous studio in Dumbo. And there, um, as you saw in, in one of the earlier slides, there I'm crushing off some rock. That's of course the, the first stage. Um, it's useful to be fairly fit uh, when you do this work. It takes a while. Um, now, as you write, uh, I think if I remember rightly, it has a hardness of about four to 4.5 on the Mohs scale. Um, I, I can uh, describe this a little bit later, but basically um, pigments or minerals are described, their hardness is described on what's called the Mohs scale, M-O-H-S. And this is talc, which is number one, that's the softest of minerals, to diamond, which I'm sure you all know, is the hardest, it's number 10 on the scale. So azurite is four to 4.5, but still it, it's, um, it requires quite a bit of physical work to crush it up. Now, from the initial crushing, you'll see that there I have a, a sieve in which you sieve out the pigment particle into the bowl top right and um, sort of medium, a mixed range of particles are falling into the bowl. And then the larger pieces I put back into the, in, into the mortar and then with the pestle, I keep crunching it down. And, um, and then I end up with, um, I try to work with about 100 grams of pigment at a time for preparation. That's about the optimal amount. Now, from this point now, this rather dull blue-gray, it's not, it's not particularly brilliant. It's, not, it's far from being ready to use as paint. Now, on the... Now, to prepare the pigment, um, one has to use casein. Now, when I first came to the US and I went to an art shop that no longer exists and I asked for casein and they said it was obsolete. But uh, in, in Germany, I'd been using it for years. So, so obviously there were quite a lot of differences at that time. This was um, in the early 1990s when I came to New York from Germany. And um, so here I show you casein, which in its powdered form is made from the curds of milk. It's essentially a milk product. It smells milky, it's not unpleasant. And to prepare it, it has to be uh, prepared with um, a borax, uh, a crystalline borax. Um, I have uh, recipes for this in, in my uh, published work and so on, in my Renaissance mysteries. But it's sufficient just here to, to, to say, uh, of course, you can buy it ready-made from, from uh, Kramer Pigments here in New York. Many art shops don't sell it um, your regular art shops where you buy tube paint. Um, but this is invaluable. This was something I discovered. Uh, it was not in any of the literature. The, when it came to preparing azurite, there were all sorts of obscure references to using shells and water and, and um, to separate particle sizes of the azurite, but it did not get rid of the impurities and main impurity being cuprite, which uh, gives it this horrible sort of gray greenish color. And you really have to remove this. And casein did the perfect job. Now, um, as I said, of course, I'm, I, make, I make everything myself, but I've been doing this long enough. And um, 
but I will now show you the actual process with casein. Now, the top, top left, you'll see there's the, that azurite after it's been crushed. And it, it's, it's not, of course, it's not an exciting color. It's just a crushed piece of rock with a bit of luck, some, some crystal inside it. Now, I add the casein, which, which I dilute, dilute. So um, it's about the same consistency as an orange juice or something. And then I start to mix this into the azurite. Now you can see the, the color of the liquid, the azurite on the top left is still quite clear. And now it's got an ugly grayish green. Now, this is, this is where the magic starts. This is really a bit like the magic of Harry Potter. And it's very, very exciting. And so you add more water to this, and then you'll see bottom left, you start pouring off this water. Um, and out of that comes this incredible deep blue. It is really the most amazing deep blue. You cannot buy this in a tube, full stop. Uh, it just would not work anyway. And you can't keep, you can't keep some of these uh, pigments in oil in a tube. Uh, chemically, it just doesn't work. So there, I'm pouring off the, the first process into another bowl. In the middle image, you can see, or hopefully you can see this um, brownish yellow rising. Now this is a fairly advanced stage. Um, this is now uh, the next grade of azurite that, that is in, I usually end up perhaps with about 10 bowls and each bowl will have different grade or different particle size of azurite. Okay, and, and so bit by bit, you have then different grades of azurite. The bottom right here, I'm showing the pig, pigments being dried out and I'm re-grinding it to produce an even purer blue. I want here some very beautiful pale blue azurite it, uh, because in this case, I had enough of the very dark blue, as you're right. Okay, now, uh, oops, let me go on to the next slide. Now, again, what you see are comparisons now under the microscope. Um, I, I was very lucky that I got uh, Chris McGlinchey, uh, the conservator, painting conservator at the Museum of Modern Art here in New York. Uh, and he had a, a new microscope with a camera and uh, we played around with it a bit and had lots of fun. And we got some of the most incredible images of large particle azurite and small particle azurite. Now, the important point of these images is that you can see these, these pigments are translucent they are letting light through. And especially that uh, large particle at the bottom of the large particle picture, how the light is just coming through that completely beautiful. Then there's the small particle and here the particle sizes are fairly homogeneous, um, which shows that you, you know my levigation process is working quite nicely. And again, you can see how translucent those particles are. And then you can see the cobalt blue, a sort of nondescript dotty picture, um, which uh, as far as I'm concerned, says everything there is to say about cobalt blue, but then I'm rather prejudiced by now. Now, these uh, images, bottom left and bottom right, these are real high-tech images. Um, 
And uh, I know conservation scientists are quite jealous of these because um, the husband of one of my models um, worked with this high-tech equipment and he did these images for me. They are called focused ion beam images. And with this beam, he could cut through one of those particles, just one. Now on the left, you see an unprepared particle, right? With tiny, tiny little bits of dust on the top. I mean, this is really tiny. And on the right, uh, the, this particle is covered in the protein layer from the casein. And the, the dark area you see at the front is where the ion beam cut through the particle. Um, I often make a joke that this looks like um, an English omelette. Uh, that's what an English omelette looks like. You look at it and don't eat it. So that, that is, is my joke at being an Englishman. So next I will move on. Now this is a, a painting, a large painting, I think you can see from the size, with large particle azurite. On, uh, this is linen glued to a panel. I prefer to work with um, linen glued to a panel. Uh, it, it's it's a, a support that will survive every gallery and, and uh, every exhibition you can think of where paintings come back totally damaged. So here, working on the floor, it, it's a, a diptych, so two panels put together, and working on the floor using a very large brush, just one brush stroke, and very freely loaded with uh, casein and rabbit skin glue as the water-based binding medium. There I was able to to be very expressive and very free, almost abstract, it could be an abstract painting on its own. And I, uh, then I tilted the panel a little bit and let some of the paint run. You can see some sort of diagonal uh, streaks where, where the water has run and moved the pigment into, into some patterns. And then on the left panel, uh, I've, I've used a stib knight. So I followed with the same brush mark, but into a different color. And I've called it labyrinth, which is a bit like a maze where you can walk into something and get completely lost. So that is um, some of the possibilities that you see uh, um, with azurite, the, the um, yellow, is um, a yellow ochre with orpiment on top. The green is a malachite. Okay, so that shows you some of the possibility there with large particle azurite here in my former studio a few years ago. And this is a, a large, large painting, but on a stretched linen uh, with very, very thin natural gesso. Um, and uh, here, a water-based binding medium in which I'm able to move the pigment around. There, you can see that the initial paint layer is in very small particle azurite. So it's a very pale blue. And then eventually it's built up with other particle sizes to give you the deep blues and the pale blues. And then the, the figure, the nude, that is worked further with different binding mediums, um, resins, uh, fur balsam resins, and with a little bit of walnut oil, which will give you th then um, other possibilities and nuances with the, with the color. Okay, now let me move on now to the next. Here, an interesting point is the blues that you see. The blue on the left is a large particle azurite in what I call casein distemper. This is a mixture of casein and rabbit skin glue. That's a water-based binder, a number of layers to produce that. The painting on the right, 
Um, it's a little bit dark on this screen. It's a bit too dark for some reason, but it's the same pigment, but in a different binding medium. The binder in the last layers of color is a fur balsam resin, a Strasbourg turpentine, and a few drops of walnut oil. And uh, as you see, the binding medium will also change the color. And again, as I, I said, this, this is due to the uh, refractive index of your pigment and binding medium. Um, this won't happen with your tube color, but this shows you, you need to also understand your binding mediums as well as your pigments. Okay, next. Now, of course, some things go completely wrong. Now, this is a painting by Raphael. This painting is in the uh, Metropolitan Museum. It's a large altarpiece. And the Madonna figure in the, in the middle, in the center, is painted with azurite. Now, they, it's unsure whether he used egg tempera or walnut oil or linseed oil. It, it's unsure. My guess is that it's a walnut oil. Now, you cannot bind azurite in exclusively in oil. When the oil yellows, the color appears to be black. You would think uh, logically a yellowing color would turn green, but that doesn't happen. It actually, in the process, goes to a dirty gray green and then Eventually, I, I haven't experienced it going black, but you, I would probably need 50 to 100 years, probably for, for this process to be completed. And I'm not that old. So um, it, it's unfortunate, but for some reason, the Italian artists had, they did not seem to have the knowledge of the fur balsam resins like the Flemish artists of Northern Europe, uh, Van Eyck, Van der Weyden, and, and so on. I'll show you a painting later on with, with um, uh, Flemish, Flemish works where the blues are in incredible condition after 500 years, uh, some even 600 years. So uh, we are talking about longevity. Um, so uh, th this painting, it's a beautiful painting, but it's, it's unfortunate. Now, the, the blue in the background, I'm not too sure. It could have, it could have been a low grade lapis lazuli or it might be an azurite. Now, when it's mixed with white, nothing happens. This is the strange thing. When lead white is mixed in with azurite or lapis lazuli, nothing changes. There's no discoloration. Even if you use walnut oil, it's uh, some things that happen in chemistry have still not been resolved. So there's a lot of work still to do to understand uh, the incredibly complex chemistry of paint layers. Now, let me move on. This is a shot now, my studio floor, where you see I've got lots of bowls with, with um, different things being prepared at the same time. So uh, I bought all these bowls from, from uh, a shop that supplies Chinese restaurants with their bowls for making sauces and whatever. Um, they only cost about three dollars a bowl in this stainless steel and fantastic to work with. Well, they were three dollars a bowl uh, 20 years ago. I don't know. Maybe what they're perhaps a little bit more. Just just on the edge of Chinatown. So anyway, um, now let me move on. So now the next part of my talk, I want to compare here, first of all, 
the difference between these two blues, lapis lazuli and azurite. Now, um, lapis lazuli, as I said, has been mined in Afghanistan for centuries. Um, it was always a problem because the warlords controlled things. Um, it was transported to Europe via the Silk Road. So I, I think most people now have heard of the Silk Road because uh, it's been talked about again. And the end of the Silk Road in Europe was Venice. So that's one of the main reasons, of course, in Italy, in many ways, why you, you get um, this Renaissance um, artists in, in Italy using lapis lazuli much more, whereas in Northern Europe, azurite was more common because azurite was mined in Germany, in now also what's Czechoslovakia and, and that part of Eastern Europe, and also fantastic azurite from Morocco in North Africa. So, um, of course, locality meant quite a lot of, you know, what you could get hold of was, of, of course, determined by locality in, in the 13th, 14th, 15th centuries. It's not like today, I get my lapis lazuli from a mineral dealer in Pakistan, and uh, it works very nicely. Uh, he sends me then uh, a parcel of azurite, takes a couple of weeks to get here, um, but there's, there's no great problem. Now, the, of course, one difference is the price. Lapis lazuli, when it's prepared, sold, and still sells for a very high price. Um, 100 grams of the highest quality can be around well over $250. Um, lower qualities for $100 for, for, for 10 grams, 20 grams. Uh, of course, I make everything myself, but it took me many, many years to work out the protocols from, uh, from manuscripts to, to get good lapis lazuli. The azurite, if you get crystals, it's easy work as, as, as uh, I've shown you, you can just crush it and levigate it. And there's no big deal getting the range of blues as long as you have good quality azurite. The top piece uh, on the right, that is not a good quality azurite. Uh, I picked it up in Arizona for next to nothing. Um, and, and it's, it's hardly worth preparing. There's, there's a huge amount of sandstone um, decomposed malachite from, from, from the azurite. Whereas the, the small crystals at the front, when, when you get something like that, then it's, it feels like Christmas day. Now, let me go on, <coughs> just have a drink. Now uh, here, um, This painting by Hans Memling. So the Flemish artists, the Northern European Renaissance. Now look at the date. This is from 1465 to maybe 1474. This, it's a large painting. It's actually a vertical golden rectangle. Incredible condition in the Metropolitan Museum. Um, I, I often used to go and, and look at this every Sunday when I went to the museum. I haven't been there for a while because of COVID, but this painting, um, the blue of the Madonna's dress is an underlayer or underlayers of azurite, because of course that's cheaper, followed by glazes and top layers of lapis lazuli. Now, of course, this is a large area of blue, so it's understandable that he then used azurite for the underlayer. 
it's an incredible painting. On the right, you see the infrared image. This is the underdrawing of the painting. And th this is the most complete and incredible underdrawing I've experienced. Um, all the folds are marked for the dress. There's very little deviation from the underdrawing. Now, of course, with pigments that are this expensive, and of course, you have to know how many layers you're going to use, then it, it is advantageous to plan out your painting. And this, of course, was very common with Renaissance artists um, in, in which they made drawings and the drawings had little pinpricks through the outline and this was placed on the panel and then using um, a pad with charcoal powder it was what's called pounced onto the drawing so all the little dots showed through on the painting as little black dots which were then joined up and of course some of this uh, boring work probably would be done by your apprentices. Okay. Now move on to the next. Now, one of my paintings, um, I, I felt the challenge to see what I could do uh, taking on European art history. And um, I think it was in 2019, we were in Florence and in the Academia. And of course, most of you know, of course, the famous Michelangelo sculpture of David is in the Academia. And of course, it's full of tourists all taking selfies in front of Michelangelo's David. But upstairs in the Academia Museum, there is a collection of early Florentine paintings um, with lots of gold leaf, and, and of course, these colors. And so here I have used Azurite for the dark blue with the stars. And, uh, and that is an Islamic pattern that I, I worked on the geometry of the art of Islam for quite a few years. So I produced this deep blue with a lead tin yellow and then the gold leaf, a pure 24 karat gold leaf. So um, I'll never be rich because I spend nearly all my uh, money on pigments and gold leaf, but why not? Now, there, the Madonna figure, um, I've, I've transcribed from this 14th century artist, Lorenzo Monaco, and I wanted to see could I get anywhere near this deep blue um, and, and as a dress? It was hell of a challenge. It took me a couple of months to get the layering right. And then the orange, it's complementary, um, is Realgar. And that is also built up with about three or four layers of Realgar to give me this deep orange lining of, of the Madonna's dress. And then the, the angel, there's cinnabar with many glazes of um, a root madder and cautional to give the deep red. And of course, the challenge of the tiles the, the, of the floor, um, a pattern, and then working in perspective to a vanishing point. And um, in the Garden of Paradise in the background, that blue um, is an azurite, a pale azurite, a small particle azurite, blended into my own lead white and sericite that gives you this incredible, I wanted this kind, I've always been intrigued by the Renaissance paintings of of skies that go into this incredibly vibrant and um, white, pale blue and white. And I was able to find it. 
um, it, it was was quite a discovery, and um, the the landscape in in, as in the Garden of Paradise is uh, from one of my wife and I our trip to to the Dolomites in North Italy. Whenever we go to Venice, then you just take a train from Venice up into the Dolomite Mountains uh, that separates then Italy from Austria. Now. Then I'll move on now to the next. Preparing lapis lazuli. Now, this, as I said, th this took me quite a long time. You, you can buy it uh, directly from, mainly from Kramer Pigments in New York. Now, top left is a good quality rock. And um, here, uh, as I state, the, the in lapis lazuli, that's five to five and a half on the Mohs scale. Now, it's hard. It, it is hard. Um, I can, I, I spend no more than about half an hour at a time crushing that up. Um, I'm, I'm debating whether to buy a mechanical crusher. Uh, I think they're about nine to ten thousand dollars. But one of the problems is controlling your particle size, even though you're supposed to be able to set it to a particle size that you would like. Um, I have absolute control over the particle size, uh, as you can see with the sieve that I, I'm using there in the image on the bottom right. And there you can see some of the pigment. Um, coming out into, into the bowl. Now, there are methods, different methods of preparing lapis lazuli. There is the famous Cianino Cianini process. Now, at some point, everyone will hear about Cianino Cianini. And he wrote this treatise in 1397. Remember that? 1397, that's a long time ago. And the problem is understanding the manuscripts. And there are many, many different recipes. Um, this one works quite well. Uh, just very briefly, you, you have to melt um, uh, resin and, and um, beeswax and some, some oil in a bowl. And then you put in your ground lapis lazuli. The finer it is, the better. And then you let that cool and it becomes something like a dough in the bottom left picture. And this dough then is uh, rubbed with linseed oil and, and you, you literally press it like a dough. You turn it over and press it. And then the recipe says you leave it standing in water for about a week. And after a week, you take uh, a weak lye solution. This is then a um, uh, potash solution. That's right, I almost forgot what it was. And uh, of course, you have to wear protective gloves. Um, because you, you, you will literally damage your hands. And in this warm water, you start kneading out the blue. The blue comes out slowly. The best blue comes out first in, in about the first 15 minutes. And then you get another bowl and then you keep pressing. And this you keep doing this actually for hours. Um, presumably, again, apprentices would have done this work. Now here, I've got, just to show you, um, I hope this, this is showing okay. This is the leftover. It is ugly as thin. This is gray with a little bit of blue. <coughs> okay, so it does work, um, but of course, I wasn't satisfied with that. So eventually I found my own protocol to remove, first of all, the pyrites. Now, 
pyrite is um, an iron sulfide. It's the most common impurity in lapis lazuli. When you buy jewelry, uh, a necklace of lapis lazuli, you may see, or you will see, spots of gold. It's not gold, it's fool's gold. Fool's gold is pyrite. So never let someone tell you it's gold. It's fool's gold. Now, initially, pyrite is not magnetic, but I found one day I'd, I'd left, um, like you can see in the top left image, I'd left um, the ground lapis in water for a week, but it ended up being about two weeks. I'd forgotten about it. I was busy doing other things. And when I looked at it, I noticed there was some, some black developing um, at the bottom of the bowl. And when I looked at it, the stainless steel bowl was starting to rust. And I thought, oh, the, the pyrite must be changing. And so I wondered if it might just be magnetic. So I have in the middle, you see this, it's a 50 pound mag magnet and it's very strong. And I put it under the bowl and I could see the particles had become magnetic. Then I, I thought, well, let me try out with some hot water. And so I boiled some water and poured that in. And when I put the magnet on, the pyrite stuck to the bowl. Like you can see the top right image, there you can still see the lapis with the, the black in it. And then I just gently washed out the lapis and there was sorry, the pure pyrite. And, the, and there I put it on a piece of paper and all the other uh, impurity that I eventually got out of it. Now, here, um, I'm grinding the, the lapis still further, and it's becoming a beautiful blue. Now, the next problem is calcite. Now, the thing is that um, I, I'm sure Eleonora will explain to you what specific gravity is all about. Um, but I, I could see that it's very close. So the between azurite and calcite. And so I thought, how am I going to get this calcite or the lazurite to float out? This was um, some lapis that I bought. The quality wasn't so brilliant. The blue was very good, but there was a lot of calcite. So I again had the idea, uh, this time I took some soap. I'd, I'd seen some old manu manuscript recipes where they had used Iraqi soap. And I, so I, I Googled to try and find if I can get Iraqi soap. And unfortunately on Google, it said uh, soap made by Iraqi refugees, refugees from Iraq, from the Iraq war. Anyway, uh, at Kramer, I found two different types of soap, one based on olive oil and the other on palm oil. So I thought, let me dissolve some, some soap in boiling water and add this to the mixture. And lo and behold, the calcite lifted when I poured the boiling water into, into the dry pigment. Quite amazing. And then I was able to pour off the calcite and really remove quite a lot of it. So I was very pleased with this. So there you can see the final result. And this is really 
the most exquisite lapis lazuli imaginable. So, and, and there you can see I have then jars of different grades, which I keep then um, numbered. And below the two uh, images, bottom right, pure pyrite, which is all rusted now. It had been in water for so long, it was completely rusted. And also through levigation, at the end you levigate things further with casein. And you can see I have literally separated out 99% of the impurity. Of course, I don't sell this. This would, it would be too expensive for anyone to buy, but it goes into my paintings. So uh, it, unfortunately it does, it does sort of make the paintings a little bit expensive sometimes. Now, here's a, a painting. Um, it's a, not a large painting, but of course, to have this amount of pure lapis lazuli takes quite a bit of work. But um, when you see this in real life, this lapis lazuli again against pure gold leaf, I, I can understand why the uh, Renaissance artists were, were so mesmerized by these two, um, by this pigment and by gold leaf. And of course, they, they had the advantage that the, the church was paying for all this. Um, I have the disadvantage, I have to finance it first and then find a buyer. Uh, fortunately, I do have a few uh, who, who keep buying and keep me going. But uh, it, it is, uh, and here in this painting, again, 24 karat gold leaf, this is wet gilding, which gives you then the possibility of polishing the gold leaf. So it really looks like a solid piece of, of gold leaf. And, um, and then in the other part of the painting, again, I've used an Islamic pattern and very freely there, you have uh, just a couple of layers of lapis lazuli, the blue, and then uh, or piment and yellow ochres and little bits of cinnabar and some some brown earths to complement the the whole color composition. Okay, so next I'll move on to now. This is your again typical layering, the optimal layer layering to achieve the sort of signature. Um, blue. And in, in a way, I've also uh, found that I can cut the costs a little bit, but also produce a very beautiful final blue by having the first layer of the uh, perhaps a lower grade of lapis lazuli mixed with my own lead white or sericite. Um, sericite is the um, mineral uh, which produces a natural lead white. Uh, I'll show you this later. And this is then over uh, a gesso ground. And the gesso ground that I make um, is, is a mixture with, with marble, dust, chalk, rabbit skin glue, um, and so on. So there you can see, and, and of course there will be many, many more layers, especially <clears throat> for the uh, final glazes of, of lapis lazuli. Now here again, this, these, this painting is in um, the Metropolitan Museum of Art and this painting was restored uh, a few years ago, <clears throat> and they made a, a special exhibition um, showing some of the points of the restoration. It was a very, very interesting exhibition, just in one room in, 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 at the Metropolitan. And on the left, you see before restoration, I mean, the painting was in 
very good condition, but the Madonna's cloak was black again. But this time, the blackness was superficial. This was a varnish, an oil resin varnish, which are notorious. And um, it had yellowed very, very much. And of course, again, it doesn't turn the lapis green, but black. And, and it's, it's a very odd phenomena. <clears throat> you can see with the other colors, the red, the red on the left actually looks warmer and the red on, on the right is, is somewhat cooler. The green is hardly changed, the green at the bottom of the sleeve. There's, there's not a lot, of, a lot of difference, but the blue and the lapis lazuli blue and, and of course, it's quite a large area. Um, whenever I, I went to the museum, it's the only time I ever felt really jealous of another artist, but there was no way I could, I could text him and, and find out his secrets. I just had to spend years experimenting to try and come up with, with my solution. But for me, th this is, uh, it's an exquisite painting. And, and um, just, you know, even if you're not, I mean, I'm not particularly in, into um, religious themes. Um, it's all part of, of European art history. Um, but of course, since the church was paying for all this, it's, it's kind of obvious that you don't do a self-portrait or, or, you know, a portrait of your girlfriend. You do one of the Madonna. So th th this shows you uh, what can, can be achieved. Now, let me move on now <clears throat> to Malachite. Now, there are, there's a lot of Malachite throughout our planet and of course of different qualities. Um, in the left, left image, you see malachite that's being cut and polished. And you often find specimens like this in gem shops, um, you know, shops selling gems. Um, they often offer these so-called cures. So if you put this under your pillow at night, you wake up tomorrow and you don't have a brain tumor anymore. I don't know if it works, but um, sometimes they have some interesting specimens and I just buy them, keep them in my collection of rocks and minerals uh, because, you know, I never know um, what I might find when, when I go rock hunting. Now on the right, there you see again different particle sizes. This again has been ground and levigated in a weak casing solution. And there you see my glass muller, <clears throat> which, which I use then to, to mull the pigments. Next, again, some more green pigments, malachite, pseudo malachite and green jasper. Now, the green jasper on the left, the top three specimens, the top row is green jasper. These are flints, they're extremely hard. Um, if, if you can uh, find someone to crush this, it, it's fine. It's, it's um, sometimes if I'm desperate, I, I just buy some from from Kramer pigment already crushed and so on. Um, it, it just depends. And, and then I might just grind it further myself and, and levigate it to different particle sizes. The uh, middle row, this is a pseudo malachite. It's chemically just slightly different from malachite, but it gives you the most incredible green and the chemical industry has never come up with anything this beautiful. You will not buy this 
as a tube of paint. It's just not possible. Fortunately, Mother Nature has a chemistry which is, I, I still think, more superior than, than what we can produce in the laboratory. And then the bottom row on the left, these are little nodules of malachite. Malachite comes in all sorts of, of varieties and so on. So, um, and of course, over the 30 odd years I've been working with these pigments, I, um, I'm a pretty good geologist by now and I can identify most of the rocks that I see. On the, on the right there, you can see then um, the, uh, now the top and bottom left okay, is malachite, different particle sizes. And then you, you've got green jasper and, um, and then the top and bottom right, that's your pseudo malachite. So now the funny thing is the green jasper often looks sort of bit dull as a pigment, but in fertile sand resin with a little bit of walnut oil, it changes so completely. It is then uh, a green that you could use very easily in if, if you, wanted to be a landscape painter or, or even in abstract paintings and so on. It's very flexible and, and quite, quite a remarkable pigment. Uh, <clears throat> here you can see the levigation process and of course the top right uh, bowl, there you see the impurities. Again, a little bit similar like with azurite because of course malachite um, is chemically quite close to azurite. It just has, uh, I think, a, a hydroxyl molecule more that turns it to green. And the, so the, this sort of brownish uh, impurity that comes out is, is of course tinged with green. And, and so there you can see bottom right is a large particle malachite. Now, those white dots that you see, um, that's actually sparkling crystal. The, the problem with digital photography is that it cannot deal with sparkling crystals. So the sparkle just appears as white dots. So, um, so our modern digital photography is very limited, um, more limited, I think, than what we believe. Now, one of my fun paintings, I call it uh, Evolution of a Myth, Eve's Triumph, where she's got rid of the fig leaf and poor old Adam is having a tough time with the serpent. Um, I, I suppose most of you know of the, the story of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Paradise. Well, this is my, my version. Um, it, it's, it's an English version uh, with a sense of British humor. Um, but the important thing that I want to show you here is that the green are, is made up of many layers of pseudo malachite. And, uh, and Eve, the, the female figure, the, the sort of crazy, crazy female figure in the background, that's cinnabar, simply cinnabar. And, and the tree is made up of different particle sizes of azurite and some brown earths and different colors. And the snake, the snake is orpiment and realgar. So, uh, and, and I like my snake. So next one. Okay, other greens, green jasper, vivianite, turquoise, which you may have heard of because that's also a precious stone. You can get, you can get jewelry ma made of, of turquoise. Now, <clears throat> the, you can see the comparison bottom left with, with turquoise and chrysocolla. 
Now, turquoise may appear um, less powerful um, as a, a pigment, but again, once it's in a fur balsam resin, and it has to be in a fur balsam resin, so Strasbourg turpentine or large turpentine, I'll be discussing uh, binding mediums in, in, a, in an, another presentation. But then it, it lives up to its expense. Uh, Chrysocolis stays much the same as you can see in the rock on the, the uh, bottom right in the left image and also the bottom right in the right image. And, uh, and the top, top images um, on the right side, there you can, you can see the larger pigment particle sizes. Now, here I was, I was lucky, um, I deal with a, a mineral dealer here in New York, and uh, he found this for me. And uh, these were pieces of turquoise, quite good quality. And uh, so he, he asked me if I would be interested because it was $600. And I said, sure. So I, I bought them and um, then uh, and, and you can see there's, there's also quite a bit of impurity. Of course, it comes with, with a matrix. The, the rock is, you know, in, in with other rock that's being mined. Then here, though, the preparation, the levigation in casein was quite extraordinary. And this kind of brown milky color came out but also you can see, I think you can see quite clearly in both images, these sort of black dots. Now, these, these are quite difficult to, to get out. And the only way you can do it, it, it's best then to grind turquoise as finely as you can. And each time you grind it, you levigate and then dry it out again over a double boiler, never dry it out directly on heat but over my double boiler and steam dry. And then you grind it again and levigate until you, you end up with, as you're, with um, uh, turquoise that's, that's as pure as possible. Next. Now, this is one of my paintings with, with uh, turquoise. It's a on my screen, it's a little bit darker than what it is in, in real life. And the floor pattern at the bottom is with, with uh, a turquoise. And uh, probably, if I remember rightly, maybe about three layers. Um, and and it, 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 it is an extraordinary color. And in the figure, um, because, because uh, for me, the, the figures I paint, I, I call them polychromatic figures. Um, I, don't, I don't paint the color of skin, whatever skin it might be. For, for me, um, the figure is a vehicle for color. And uh, in this one, I've also used the turquoise for the main skin color and highlighted, I, I think, with some lead tin yellow, with, with uh, some yellow ochre over it. So, and on, on the, the right panel, that's gold leaf. And the, the white is just finely ground calcite that's floated in a casein distemper over the gold leaf. And um, the, the uh, geometric figure, this is part of my uh, homage to Dura, who used this um, irregular um, octahedron in, in his, uh, in, in his um, uh, I think it was an etching, that's right, a print of, of melancholia. Okay, so let me move on. Now the next here, you've got, uh, again, green jasper and top and bottom left there you can see quite quite a, a difference and then some european and american earth pigments 
these are literally from soil that's been cleaned and or can be rock outcrops. Um, I've seen some by roadsides and so on, and you can collect them very cheap, beautiful to work with. Um, and and uh, I, I would always advise people, and of course, th these, these pigments are the cheapest to use if, if you're um, doing, you know, work on walls and frescoes and so on. Um, these pigments work, work very well um, on a lime base where, where you're using lime water for your fresco. There's no problem. Like, as you're right, you cannot use in one fresco. So now let's move to the next one. Now, this, this painting is a, 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 a sort of simple landscape that I made, again, a Korean landscape in the mountains. And um, you, using green jasper and green earth pigments, the greens. <clears throat> the yellow to yellow orange, Rialga, with um, uh, azurite and stibnite. My voice is getting a bit dry. Okay, so now, and, and <clears throat> I, I love these, uh, the, the landscapes in Korea because you have these layers of mountains, which I felt fitted with my layers of pigment. <clears throat> now, here we've got <clears throat> cinnabar. Now, you, <clears throat> those of you from China will be happy to know there are lots of deposits of this stuff in China. And it goes back centuries when the Chinese alchemists played with this stuff. Now, uh, unfortunately, many of them died because they heated it up and it's a mercuric sulfide. Now that turns into vapors of mercury and sulfur. And <clears throat> I wouldn't never try it myself. I've never tried it myself because I'm still alive. I don't know how quickly you die, but um, it is extremely toxic. So never, never put this on a stove and play around with it. Um, <clears throat> it gives you a beautiful color that is un undisputed. Um, in Europe, they found a way, uh, two methods of putting um, mercury and sulfur together to produce their vermilion. And you could do this if you have very low grade um, rocks and, and separate out the components and they can be recombined obviously to make um, vermilion, but vermilion only comes in one color. It's an orange red. Whereas the uh, mineral, you can then produce many, well, about three or four different grades of orange to deep red. Now, in this example, here on the left, you see the crystals in this matrix. And with a hammer and a chisel, I just knocked out each crystal. It took quite some time because I, I had a bag of, of this, which I, I don't know, I can't remember where I bought it. And then here you can see, uh, it's, it's, it's quite a soft mineral. This is soft. I think it's about two on the Mohs scale, one and a half to two, I think. And um, you have to grind very carefully because very quickly you have like on the, the right image, you have this orange, more orangish red. And on the, on the left you have an incredible deep red. The white you see there are, is the shining of the crystal. This is again, the, the photography problem. Now, here, the levigation. And of course, uh, out, of, out of this, you get also an incredible orange. 
but you don't get a lot of pigment in, in the orange. Um, you would have to really grind a lot of pigment to end up with, with orange. And the orange does look like this in the color. And it's, <clears throat> it's nicer than any synthetic orange. I, I've never been very keen on the modern orange colors that you get in, in oil and acrylic paint. One of my uh, large paintings here using cinnabar, different grades of cinnabar. This is a large painting in, in two panels. It's now in a, a private collection in Vienna, in Austria. And um, the, some of the red has a cautional glaze over it, but you can also see that some of the red where it goes in the junction from um, being on a white gesso ground to being on a gold leaf ground changes its color completely. It's very, very interesting what happens there. So again, although it's a pigment of refractive index, so remember that means that it's more opaque, still in comparison to modern Opaque, opaque pigments. The light can still come through the pigment. And this is, is what you experience here. Um, <clears throat> the left panel, as you can see, it has a gold leaf ground. And, and I think th about at least three layers of, of pure gold leaf that's polished and then with the paint over it. So, um, Yes, my, my collector in Vienna is not short of, of dollars. So I love that painting anyway. Now, next, we, we take um, ore pigment and realgar. So here, both are arsenic sulfides. And, and of course, these, these are toxic. Um, you have to be careful. You wear a, a dust mask and I wear some kitchen gloves, uh, the, the ones that you can get from a Korean market. They're, they're very good, very thin. You, you can work very well with them because you don't want to get this on your hands either because um, arsenic can be absorbed through the skin. It was always good in, in, in history if you wanted to get rid of the emperor's uh, uh, offspring or a... a uh, a, a prince in Europe, you just give them a, a, a dose of this and off they go. Now, uh, I did find uh, for, for those of you from, from China, there's, uh, you, uh, I can't pronounce it, but there's the Chinese name for Rialgar. And um, apparently in Chinese, it means masculine yellow. So that's this orange on the right. This is a, an incredible crystal. And uh, <clears throat> the orpiment on the left in Chinese is known as the feminine yellow. So there you are, you've got your yin and yang, even with uh, pigments in, in the Chinese language. I, I thought that was, that was uh, quite a nice little discovery. Uh, maybe one of the uh, uh, Chinese students can can actually tell me how it's pronounced, or I, I, I may ask one here. Okay, so there anyway, you see different qualities of orpiment on the left, but a most beautiful golden yellow. And of course, Rialgar, uh, the crystals will vary, of course, like everything in nature. Now, Next, um, we've got grinding orpiment. Now, orpiment's quite soft, but it is a problem for grinding. It becomes very greasy on, on the glass plate. It's a sandblasted glass plate that I work on. And you can see these sort of stringy crystals in the image on the left. An image on the right now, it's breaking down, but you can see how much has smeared onto the glass plate. It, it, it's, um, it's very strange, but 
that is the the yellow that you will will get um this yellow i i will talk in in the next talk cannot be mixed with oil because it will never dry next we've got realgar and this is one of my favorite oranges um it, it is most incredible and and of course uh, I, d I don't think a, a, mon a modern manufacturing paint manufacturer would be allowed any way to produce this. Um, I know that uh, Kramer Pigment will not sell it in the US. Uh, you have to have special permission. Um, I have no problem because I go and get the, the crystals and prepare it myself. But you do have to be careful with it. But once it's bound in a fur balsam resin, a, couple of drops of oil to stop the resin becoming brittle and 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 it's 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 very safe uh, you'll find realgar in paintings by titian and you can identify the realgar very easily after the 500 years it it's it's quite a remarkable color and there <clears throat> of course you can see in the levigated pigment on the left you can also produce a yellow that's very close to orpiment. It, it would be very difficult to tell the difference, but you don't get as much uh, of this yellow from, from the levigation process. Now, one of my super large triptychs, um, this is big. Uh, the figure in the middle is a life-size cast. And she was, uh, if I remember right, she's about five feet ten, so tall, uh, taller than what I am. And uh, from the plaster cast, then the, the figure is in uh, a Japanese uh, rice paper with rabbit skin glue, and then reinforced with fiberglass. And the this is then uh, linen glued to panels. And this is my. Um, Echo and Narcissus, Last Judgment with Echo and Narcissus, Echo on the left, and Narcissus who falls in love with himself. It, it's one of the Greek myths, a beautiful myth, and Echo, uh, Narcissus, the most beautiful man who falls, himself, falls in love with himself, uh, looking at his own reflection, and uh, lovely Echo who loves him, um, calling out Narcissus, 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 and she turns into an echo. And that's the end of that story. So this was my triptych, but the main point here being that in the right panel, that large area, top right there, or at the top of the painting, that's a Rielgar orange, incredible orange, next to a lead tin yellow, which I'll talk about soon. And the um, gray to black in the right panel is um, a magnetite. This is literally a magnetic pigment. Uh, and I use a magnet to apply it. I put the magnet underneath the panel and then move the pigment around with a magnet. So, uh, and that of course, you could never do with tube paint. You can't even buy that. The middle panel of course has got lapis lazuli, um, at the top, I, 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 I think the green, I think the green is a very fine malachite with some cinnabar mixed with white. And um, the pink is also a cinnabar mi mixed with calcite and lead white. And the left panel, again, um, lapis lazuli. And compared that with the azurite, the azurite, the, the lower blue. And the, the dress of, of Echo is made up of many layers of, uh, it starts with a lapis lazuli blue underneath. The first layer is a lapis lazuli blue. If you were to look at the painting very closely, you might find, you'll see some purple in the shadows. And then following the lapis lazuli, there's, there's a cinnabar mixed with lead white to give pink and then yellows, lead tin yellow, 
orpiment and, and then further layers until I produce what looks like many layered dress. Um, it, it's amazing what you can do with these pigments. I would not be able to do this or get anywhere near this with tube paint because this relies on many layers of translucent pigment to give me that final quality. Okay, and that's me in the studio with, with, that, with that painting uh, while I was working on it, just to give you an idea of the scale. Um, next, we come to the reds and brown earths. And um, these uh, I've picked up um, in different places, in quarries, uh, road outcrops, and so on. Uh, the yellow ochres, um, the bottom one I picked up by the roadside in southern Utah. The uh, yellow ochre at the top, slightly more yellow. That was from a quarry in France. Um, you weren't supposed to pick things up, but there were no cameras. And so I thought, well, why not? <coughs> Now, there you can see, as I said, um, this was in southern Utah, a wonderful road outcrop we were driving along and we suddenly came across all these colors coming out the side of the road. And so I collected some red and, and yellow earth. Some of them had dropped down to the roadside through the weathering and I put them in my backpack and uh, brought them back from Las Vegas, the, the closest airport. Um, on the top right, there you can see just getting crushed, the yellow ochre in the pestle and mortar, and then the usual process with levigation in casein, giving me then large, the, the <coughs> difference in size doesn't make much difference in the color with the earth pigments at all. One of my paintings, the background there is a yellow ochre um, and, and uh, very rich color, much nicer than the, the yellow ochre that you get out of any tube paint. And, and uh, again, because I can modify it slightly um, according to the quality of the ochre itself. And um, the other colors that th this painting um, carousel, um, literally a carousel, and um, it goes around and around. And uh, I, I, uh, that's my uh, British humor version of the devil at the front. Uh, but the important thing is he has the most exquisite Rialgar orange in his uh, tunic and his horns are, are um, I think uh, cinnabar and realgar. Okay. Uh, now, so now next on to some of the other pigments. Uh, we've got pyrolusite, galena, vivianite, stibnite, and purpurite. Again, you'll get none of these pigments in as tubes of paint, um, and. Uh, you, uh, yes, in, in fact, you, you, I think the manganese oxide, the pyrolusite, you can find a manganese black uh, as a synthetic pigment. But uh, again, here, the important point is I can control this with pigment particle size. An interesting thing, um, the uh, pigment on the on the right, the far right, that is a vivianite, and um, vivianite can be green to blue, and as a green pigment, it's very translucent and will make a very nice dark green glaze over malachite, and will give you a green that's that's unbelievable. On. Ah, yes. Now here, an example of pyrolusite, the black. Now, um, 
and it can be black to gray. The very fine particles will give you gray and the, the larger particles, medium sized particles too, will give you a deep black. And this is a, a fairly large uh, diptych. And again, um, the, 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 it's with gold leaf and the figure is stepping into a sort of into eternity on these blocks of gold leaf. And, and the, the rest of the, the pyrolusite was in um, a casing distemper with rabbit skin glue. So, and worked on the floor and, and very freely, the right panel is basically an abstract painting. Uh, I mentioned this before, the magnetite. These are um, fantastic developed crystals of magnetite. Uh, it's almost, I, I, I haven't crushed these up. This was almost too beautiful to destroy. So I, I keep this for, for presentations or when I give lectures to have some examples of of these incredible tetrahedra crystals. And the magnetite in this painting is, is of course, the black background where um, when you see the painting, you can see the patterns that I created using a magnet underneath the panel. Okay, and this painting is called the Geometry of Life, where those spirals are based on DNA geometry. And very simple painting, the colors, uh, the deep blue azurite against magnetite, and, um, and then a, a deeper cinnabar red for the other figure with a, a gold leaf dress which I, was, I applied with a, a resin and then drew into the, the sticky resin to create the dress pattern. One can experiment hell of a lot with these things. Now, we come to, to sericite, the main, one of the main whites. Now, it's very difficult to get um, manufactured lead white because the EU banned it, it's banned in the US. You can buy online a sort of unprepared lead carbonate, basic lead carbonate, but you would need to know how to prepare this. It, it's, it's, um, it's not that difficult, but you have to understand how the chemistry works. I mean, it's not that difficult, but um, you can purify it with vinegar and hot water. Um, vinegar and hot water with basic lead carbonate will do wonders. And um, it took a bit of working out, but, but it, it does produce wonderful white if you can get the basic lead carbonate. The, the important thing is though, that it's much more, it gives you a much nicer white than titanium white. The only reason I use titanium white is, is mixed with the chalk in, in my gesso to, to give me a very brilliant white gesso, but otherwise I have no use for titanium white. Now, let me move on to, this is sericite under the microscope. And as you can see, it's got very irregular particle sizes. So you do have to grind it as finely as possible, but it, it's uh, not a, a big problem to work with. Now, this painting, this I did um, last year where I had started to experiment mixing small particle azurite with my lead white and mainly sericite and some quartz. Now, it's difficult to see uh, on a, a computer, but in daylight, this pale blue vibrates almost. It's, it's the most fascinating physical experience. Um, and, and I was really surprised that the effect it had 
against then this very dark brown of these centaurs, the, these um, mythological half horse, half man um, that represented the brutality of hu human humanity in a way, and and of, of course uh, warfare generally. But uh, for me, in terms of a composition, it was really quite fascinating. And then again, so this is then the red, is a cinnabar with some glazes of root matter um, to, to and, and this figure comes out about, uh, uh, well, it, it's half the depth of an actual figure from, from the model that I, I cast. She's still alive, by the way, so just in case you're worried. Now, here uh, we am com coming now to the end of the, uh, this presentation. Uh, we've got natural root matters and cautional carbine, the natural organic pigments. Now, <clears throat> I, I many years ago I did try it out myself with with the roots of the madder plant, which. You, which I crushed up in a coffee grinder, since I don't drink much coffee. I use this coffee grinder because you it destroyed it, basically. And then you have to ferment the this uh, ground up root matter and you ferment it and you, you squeeze it out and you get this red liquid. And then the red liquid has to be then fixed to a substrate which you do with a bit of chemistry. Um, it reminded me of the ancient alchemists uh, because you had all this stuff frothing and, and out of it, this red pigment settles. And there you can see the variety of reds that you get, uh, including then cautional this on the right one, the bottom right. Um, I, I, I just buy it now be, because I spend so much time anyway preparing pigments and, and uh, this is just uh, too much to, to prepare myself all the time. But here you can see in, in this painting, in my one of my homage to Dura series, um, th that uh, I've got cinnabar, different uh, particle sizes of cinnabar and cautional red. And uh, the yellow is an orpiment over lead tin yellow. So very simple color scheme. The left panel is gold leaf ground with the pigment on top. Okay, and then move on. Indigo, uh, that goes back centuries, of course. And uh, I, I just buy my natural indigo from Kramer. Um, some, sometimes it's a bit gritty, but you have to grind it as finely as possible. And here uh, in the right uh, image, you can see uh, a very thin layer um, with, with a Strasbourg turpentine and a few drops of oil to give you this still lovely lovely blue in its own right and then the second and third layer giving you an incredibly deep blue it's not quite black it's still blue in daylight you you can still see that it's blue and this of course was most common in in the uh, early renaissance these two paintings um these are in the Uffizi in florence they, they are in the same room and uh, look at the dates. I mean, this is a long time ago, uh, 1300, the beginning of 1300s, and they're in remarkable condition. They're on wooden panels, of course, gold leaf and, and uh, probably the, the best pigments that the monastery could afford at the time. Um, and, and, I always enjoy seeing these. I mean, uh, huge paintings. I mean, four meters fifty high. That, that, that's that's no joke to paint. Now I've mentioned this a few times. 
one of the historically manufactured pigments, a lead tin yellow. Um, you, I, I, I cannot produce it myself. You, you take lead and you take tin and you heat them to uh, anything between, I think, 600 and 800 degrees centigrade, and you will get the different types of yellow. The brighter yellow, bottom left, that's lead tin yellow one, and the more warmer yellow, that's lead tin yellow two. And that's compared with orpiment and rialgar at, at, at the top there. And then, my I think my final painting here and this is the figure on the left that's the lead tin yellow uh, lead tin yellows one and two and and of course there's this azurite one of the deepest blacks that I could produce with with um, pyrolusite and and um, some gold leaf and and that's it there's an and, and uh, I think uh, a brown earth uh, as well. So very, very simple color scheme. So anyway, this, this gives you um, a bit of, a, of an introduction into the materials that you find through art history. And um, they were used up until mid 19th century when, um, as I said, first of all, you had the collapsible metal tube in 1845. By the mid 1800s, the modern oil paint was going into the tubes and that gave birth to impressionism where artists could go outdoors and paint, literally. You know, you could put then your tubes in a backpack and off you go. You, you couldn't really do this. You, um, before that. And so since the mid 19th century, this tradition has died out almost universally, except, of course, in Japan. Japan still has what's called, they're called Nihonga masters. They still teach a few students the Nihonga tradition. Uh, the Nihonga tradition uses mineral pigments, but basically in one hide glue. Um, also, in Islamic art, there's still a tradition, um, mainly on paper, of using mineral pigments, but again, often in gum Arabic, uh, water-based binding mediums. Europe, it's basically died out completely, um, and I've been trying to revive it a little bit through um, my, my books. I'll just show you one of them, just in case. Uh, it's, I think, on my websites anyway. Um, I, I think the Pratt may, I'm not too sure if the Pratt Library has, has one or not. And um, I've given you some further links um, if you want to look at my blogs to, to just have a look at some of the additional information. And at the bottom, if you want to see um, a video, a short video, about seven minutes, I try to, to put it with the PowerPoint, but it doesn't work. But if you click onto that link at the bottom, um, it's to do with my published paper with Colum the Columbia University project from a 16th century French manuscript. And you will just scroll down and you'll come across a video, a seven minute video, showing you the levigation of Azurite. Okay, so uh, with that, um, I, I will finish and finish my glass of wine. So uh, I, 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 I hope you've understood most of that. Okay, so with that then I will stop the share. Okay, and uh, end the presentation.